other heavy fighting reporting near the capital. Yeah, well, the, the destruction of that armored column is really fascinating. Actually, we've seen it time and again, something similar happening. This time it, it took place in a little town called Rovery, which is about 10 miles or so outside to the east of Kiev. And yeah, you've got that video on the ground uh, of people filming the, the scene of destruction after the attack had taken place. Um, incredible close-up video, armored personnel carriers, tanks absolutely destroyed by what appeared to have been you know, anti-tank uh, missiles. Um, in one of the videos, which has been filmed on a cell phone, you can hear you know, the narrator saying, you know, look, this is what happens to you if you come to Ukrainian land. And so it, it underlines just how much defiance, just how much will there is still uh, among the Ukrainian defense forces to push back these Russian advances. There's incredible video from the air as well, uh, from a drone, uh, which is actually watching as the attack on the ground of that column sort of takes place. You can see that you know, the front of the column, the back of the column, they're actually being absolutely devastated by a massive um, you know, ground assault uh, on those tanks. Not just the column that was destroyed, it was also the commander of that column as well. He was liquidated in the words of the Ukrainian uh, Defense Ministry. So it, it's one of those battlefield victories. It's tactical. It's, you know, it's, it's boosting morale. But, and this is you know, the painful reality, is that it's battlefield losses like this for the Kremlin that may well push Vladimir Putin sort of over the, over the edge and you know, encourage him to double down rather than back down, double down on the military pressure he's going to put on this country and on this city to enable it to fall. And so, you know, that's the danger of, of this. Doesn't mean they shouldn't do it, of course, but you know, nevertheless, it's inherently you know, hazardous to defeat the Russians in this way. Matthew, how many um, roads like that? I mean, how many routes are there into Kiev? Because obviously, you know, the, the, the roads are the way the, the Russians are moving. The Ukrainians obviously know the roads well and can set up ambushes, uh, assuming that was uh, an ambush, uh, as, as seems likely. Um, are, there, I mean, are there many routes into the city that Russian forces can use? Um, I mean, there are, I think. I mean, it's a, it's a big city, 3 million people, and, you know, it's obviously 360 degrees. You can, you can get into it by various different routes. But, yes, of course, the Ukrainians know which routes these massive armored columns are traveling along. I mean, it's very difficult to hide them. They've got their own drone um, intel. They've got human intel, and I expect they're getting intelligence uh, from, from Western sources as well. I don't, I don't know that for a fact, but I expect that they are. And, you know, the problem with, I mean, one of the easiest things to do if you want to lose a tank column is drive it into a built-up area with, a, with an army waiting for it, armed with Javelin, US-provided anti-tank missiles. And that's exactly what the Russians are doing. Their original tactic or strategy was to take strategic airports around the capital and then fly in uh, reinforcements and armor in order to you know, spread out within with forces and, and, with, and with, you know, the various weaponry inside the capital. It didn't work out. I encountered those Russian special forces in the hours after they landed here. They held on to the airport for a day or so, but then there was a massive counterattack, and they were forced out of the strategic air bases that they'd taken um, in the first few hours of this of this conflict. And so, uh, to get the supplies in, to get the forces around the city, the Russians were left with no option but to do it over land, uh, through muddy fields, through roads that were easily ambushed, and this is the result of that method. We're seeing, I mean, I went to a, a column that was destroyed a few days ago, and there were bodies everywhere. There were, you know, destroyed vehicles that were just sitting ducks on a bridge, you know, uh, as it approached the, uh, the, the northern, you know, sort of limits of, of Kiev. And this is almost exactly the same type of situation played out in Brovery um, earlier today, I understand. And the shelling, uh, obviously, we've seen in Mariupol, we saw those uh, those images, Alice and Victor were just they're showing them, uh, of a uh, mass, gra mass grave that, that's been dug. Uh, essentially, for, for residents there, there's there's no possibility of having uh, private cer ceremony, you know, private services. It's, it is just one of the, the horrible realities of the very, very difficult situation in Mariupol right now. Yeah, I mean, Mariupol is, I mean, it's a bloodbath. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a humanitarian catastrophe. I mean, you've got thousands of people trapped inside this sort of pretty small little city, and they're being absolutely bombarded by, by Russian forces with, with no regard whatsoever, it seems, for residential areas, 
uh, civilian infrastructure, and that's, that's underlined by that attack, that bombing, uh, that assault on a maternity hospital in the middle of Mariupol. We've seen those images of, like, you know, patients, women, pregnant women, being you know, carried out uh, of the building, which had been absolutely shattered by what looked like to be immensely powerful bombs. There are horrific images circulating of you know, pregnant, pregnant women sort of blooded by, by the attack. And of course, the Russian reaction to all of this isn't to apologize, it's not even to accept responsibility. I mean, Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, was asked about it today uh, in, uh, after the peace talks that he wanted to talk to, he was engaged in with his Ukrainian counterpart in Turkey. And he said, look, you know, this is basically fake news. You know, we know that this maternity hospital, the patients had already been cleared out several weeks ago, he said, and it had been taken over by the Azov Battalion, which is a sort of far right-wing you know, kind of militia that, that, that fights with the Ukrainian forces near the front line, the very anti-Russian, very far right. Um, and he said it's those people that, that were being attacked inside this building. But of course, that's totally contradicted, not just by the images of the, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the blooded mothers, or would-be mothers that we've seen, by the fact that three people, including a child, was killed in, in this incident, but also by the other you know, hundreds and upon hundreds of civilians that they've had to bury in mass graves in Mariupol over the past couple of days because it's simply too dangerous to give people individual funeral sites. Yeah. Uh, it's remarkable how many autocrats and, and, their, and their spokespeople use that term fake news uh, when they want to, uh, to lie now. Matthew Chance, appreciate it. Thank you. More than two